In the previous video, we took time to look at the T terminal, and today I want to look at the D terminal. I get a lot of questions on some of my repair videos about the D terminal, and uh, so how can you even get around it in some cases? Well, I've actually done quite a bit of research. I already knew a little bit about the T terminal, and I shared it before with some questions, tried to answer some, tried to give a little bit of detail on the D, but still never fully figured it out, and I really still hadn't. But I figured this would be a good time to try to explain more about it. As I mentioned in the previous video, it's a lot of, um, a lot of time been spent going through and trying to get data sheets and components information off of this little BMS board that we prepared before with Q12 and one of the first videos I did on the Ego 56 vote. But I get a lot of questions about the D terminal, what it means, um, what does it do. And I know it's been a, a couple of viewers that have commented about trying to use the Nexus power system and th they even have some seven and a half amp hour or five amp hour batteries. And they said, I would love to, to have my bank that I made of sales hook up to the Nexus power system. And they want to know information about it. And um, the first thing I say is that I don't have a Nexus power system. So therefore, I, I really don't know what it takes. Most of them come back and say, well, I know it takes this D connection. What does it do? And um, like I said, I, I actually... Believe it or not, I researched it extensively. I thought I would finally come up with a solution, whether it was a pulse it was looking for or some signal resistor. Unfortunately, it's not as simple as the T. The T terminal, as we mentioned in the previous video, is, is pretty much a resistor here on this board coming back through so you can read from negative. The D is a little bit different. It does actually read. If you just own the negative to the D, we read about 10K ohms, which is real similar to the T. So you know, when I first started looking into this, I thought this is just going to be a resistor to let you know the packs detected or, or something of that nature. And I, and I tell you, the further I got to looking into it, the deeper <laughs> it seemed to be. Um, if we look at this BMS board uh, blown up here, we talk about the way the T terminal is here. We also talked about the NTCs coming in here. But what's a little bit different about the D terminal Although it comes in, it comes in right here on this green wire. And as you've seen, we measure right at 10K, which is almost what a NTC would typically read. The more we dig into this, and it took some time to do because you're not just following traces. It actually goes through and goes through vias and it makes its way through this transistor here. And I hope this will make it simple. I hope this doesn't confuse it, but I had to just hand draw this out. Now, I went a little bit further with this and finally had to hit a stopping point, but when you do hit this button on the BMS and it lights up, it does wake up or activate. The DC to DC converter comes on. And uh, just in case you find it interesting, this, this is like your bus right here. So right here where T1 is, and sorry, this is probably better right here where T1 is and your caps uh, C3 and C17. This is actually where our right at 10 volts, we usually have 10 volts DC across this bus here. I followed it back just to make sure even this U4, this TL3843, it actually has nothing really to do with the D connection at all. But I did want to draw it on out and make sure that that bus was correct. Our VCC and ground to this chip kind of verifies that we're just basically going across this actually bus here because this is actually going back to ground. So if we look at this schematic we have here, the first thing I noticed when I got it drawn out and looking at it is the D does go through a 200 ohm resistor, which is R19 right here. So it goes through R19 and it goes up. It actually goes across a 10K and back to the emitter on Q13 here. And this is Q13 right here. So we're going up and going through a 10K and coming back to the emitter. And it's tying back, of course. I got lost there, but it's tying into our ground when I traced it out. So that made sense to me. And that's also why we're getting 10 to 11K and we read this back to ground. So that was confusing me for a little while. So that's why that is. But trying to put resistance across there is not going to do you any good. Um, when you lose the D terminal, what's going to happen is 
the tool typically, at least on the blower I checked, typically you're going to get a 10 second run time and it's going to shut down. So we follow this further, we see that it actually goes through this MPN transistor. It's a 1AM and the base of it actually goes through a VIA and it goes to pin 2 on U3. So this is U3 right here. So U3 is a MB95F013K. I do know it's an 8-bit proprietary controller and actually I can't find a whole lot on it. So this is the speed control out of a blower. I was able to take it apart because uh, I don't know if you watched it or not, but I had a video. I call it a fault finding video because we went through troubleshooting, put a fuse on here troubleshooting, but it got to be so many components that was bad. Well, I'm sorry, it wasn't, it wasn't so many was bad. I had a short on here and I found that to be several components here going through and it ended up, it ended up being this microcontroller. And at the time I could not get a number off of it. I had to get into some really good light and uh, wet it and get a really good magnifying glass. And even though I believe it is laser etched off, I was able to get enough numbers off of it that I believe now, I'm not 100% certain, but I believe it is a Fujitsu MB95F636K. So I believe this 8-bit micro controller here is probably going to be similar to this one with this number here that they got etched off but um i'll get into it in a little bit but i know the tool uses pin 31 and this one uses pin 2. one reason i use this for a fault finding video i decided not to spend the money on the mosfets because they were they were shorted as i mentioned in the video we had a bad chip here at the time i couldn't even get the number off of it and i had taken several components off to see where the what was loading down on this board i put it aside and one thing i was really wanting to do with it is open it up and trace it down more of where this white wire was going so this is actually the same power connection from that same blower and we see that we were not using the T, but we were definitely using the D. So this white wire, I actually cut it from this terminal right here. So when I trace this through the board, through another board, through vias, the best I could tell, it was going to pin 31. So this is a very similar microcontroller. The closest I could find um, this series, because I believe the tool or the blower PCB is this number, with this type of pin assignment and layout. And if we look at pin 2, which is what I'm assuming is correct about this, this microcontroller being similar, because this is an obsolete chip. It ain't that I didn't find some information on it, but I couldn't find the data sheet, and pretty much all I could find was it was obsolete. So pin 2, whether it's the same or not, I'm not sure. But we see here that pin name can be PG1X0A or SNI1. So either general purpose I.O., subclock input for oscillation pin, or the trigger pin for the position direction. Either way, these microcontrollers are talking to each other because our tool uses pin 31 if I traced it down correctly. And 31 is going to show X1 or PF1 and general purpose IO or main clock IO oscillation pin. The reason I thought I'd go ahead and do this video is I probably went as far with this as I'm going to be able to go with it. So I wanted to share the information with the ego community that might be interested in pin D or might be having some issues. If that'll help you troubleshoot, that's great. But there also may be some people out there that's a lot better with microcontrollers and possibly even an electronics engineer that might be able to take this a lot further than I have. So I hope this does answer some questions that some people are having on, uh, on a lot of the repair videos. And I apologize that it doesn't totally answer uh, every question you have, but maybe that'll answer why I can't always give you a straight answer about the D terminal. But I will finish up with this. Uh, but one thing we discussed in the comments, especially in relation to the Nexus power system, the gentleman want to make comments about the D and how to get around it. And of course, he did take some uh, battery packs that he had put together, same voltage, and um, he still had his Ego, I believe 5.0 or 7.5 amp hour plugged in. So it is registering the D and registering the voltage, but he did parallel off of these packs. So it basically just doubled his capacity and he was still able to use it. Of course, there was not a good workaround to get around this board being detected and uh, communicating back with the D, the D terminal. But that is a way around it just to add more capacity. As far as using a different uh, type battery with a tool or something of that nature, it would go a lot deeper into what all the D actually does. I'll try to put some snapshots up of uh, 
some time back when I was doing some checks on the oscilloscope and just looking at the pulses, somewhere around 15 kilohertz was some pulses I was getting. I still never got a real good handle on exactly um, what was coming off the D terminal or communicating back and forth with the D from the BMS to the actual tool. But if you did learn a little bit about the D terminal on the Ego battery pack, please like, share, and subscribe. Thanks for watching.